everyone. Welcome to the Future DDS Specialty Series. My name is Nick Saber, and I'm the current Future DDS intern. I'm sure many of you have uh, some questions about what it takes to get into a specialty, and we're going to answer those questions today. For this episode, we have Dr. Duong, who is completing her endodontics residency at uh, Yukon School of uh, Dental Medicine. Uh, Dr. Duong, thank you for being here today. Of course, thank you, Nick. Happy to be here. Um, now, would you please describe your journey up to where you are now, like where you went to undergrad and where you went to dental school? Yeah. So I'm originally from San Diego. So naturally I went to UC San Diego and then I went to UC San Francisco for dental school and graduated in 2016. Afterwards, I did an AGD at the Native American Health Center in San Francisco and in Oakland. And that was through the NYU Langone program. Um, afterwards, I stayed on as a full-time general dentist at the community clinic and um, as faculty for two and a half years. And then now I'm currently a first year endo resident at UConn. And I interviewed for endo residency when I was pregnant and my baby is now 15 months. So it's just like a shout out to all the mamas out there. Wow, that's impressive. So you had a bit of a gap between dental school and, and residency then? Yes, I did. Cool, so how did you know that you wanted to get into endodontics? Was it? during dental school or did you shadow before as a pre-dent? What, what was the scenario there? So I actually had no idea I would pursue a specialty. I only did two root canals in dental school. I, I think that's pretty common for a lot of schools. I did a few more in externship and I liked it, but I didn't feel very comfortable with it. Um, I also liked every part of general dentistry at the time, and I didn't want to give up anything yet. Um, but after working for a few years in general dentistry, I started to notice that I was looking forward to the root canal procedures. And for me, it was really nice to be able to change the perception of patients to root canals. Anytime a patient hears about a root canal, they think it's going to be really painful. It's terrible. But being able to just, you know, change their perception, have them leave pain free and um, save their tooth is great. And I think most people would agree that nothing is better than a natural tooth. Um, endo also has a lot to do with the fine feel. Um, it's also methodical. We're really strict on asepsis and very detail oriented. And this all fit with my personality. Um, also, while I was working as a general dentist, I started to realize that it was impossible to keep up to date with all the new materials, the research, and just be good at everything. Um, pursuing endo would allow me to focus on what I enjoyed the most and be able to learn everything about it and, you know, of course, become a specialist in that field. And my husband's also an endodontist and seeing how happy he was to be able to focus all of his time and energy into one passion really sold me. Um, and then the final bit is I, I wanted to bring access to this type of care to community clinics. And so my um, plan is to continue to work at a community clinic once I finish residency. Oh, that's really nice. I like that. I, I work at a community clinic too. And I'm like, we're always looking for providers. So that's really cool that you can, you know, provide that specialty. Um, so how, how did you have to prepare for the application? So were there any exams that you have to take like as with oral surgery, for example, or what was going on there? So a few programs require the ADAT and more and more are not requiring it, but it's an easy way to set yourself apart from others, especially applicants with many years of experience. They're usually less likely to take the ADAT um, because they're less likely to want to restudy all of part one and part two boards. Okay. Um, so I did take the ADAT. Uh, it just helped me open up my options for um, different schools to apply to and set myself apart. And I studied by reviewing my board notes and uh, Mosby's review part two, also taking online practice tests on the ADAT knockout. 
Um, and then there's also uh, USMLE's public health epidemiology and biostats section that uh, was really helpful. So is it basically reviewing material or did you have to learn some new stuff? It's mostly review. Yeah, and for me, I focused mostly on part two boards because that was what was really relevant to me clinically. And that was a lot easier to study for. The only part that I really had to study completely new information was biostatistics because I never took biostatistics. Um, but that part was actually pretty straightforward. If you just study a few of those pages and know some calculations, you're pretty much gonna do well in that section. I see. So would you say the process was easier than like the DAT studying process? Or was it just as rigorous? Like, did you, you really had to put like all your energy into it? I'd say it was much easier than the DAT. I think there are always going to be all these random questions, random bio questions that they'll ask you, but because everything is so much more relevant, um, it's a lot easier for you to just recall what you've learned in school. And so studying wasn't as intense and I was studying after work. And so it's, and it was doable. And usually I'd say people probably study about three to four months. And I believe the exam is about four hours long. Okay. So uh, would you please describe to us the typical day uh, day in the life of an endodontics resident, uh, like what kind of patients do you see? What I mean, I assume it's mainly root canals. Is there anything else that an endodontist does? Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so and then how does that compare to dental school for you? Okay, so we generally see about three to four patients a day. Um, three, four, they're usually two hour treatments that we see and uh, one for a consultation. So compared to dental school, it's more patients than you would normally see. So it is faster paced, but compared to other specialty programs, I'd say we still see less patients because endo is usually more time consuming per treatment. Um, at UConn, we generally do two visit uh, treatments. So because we only have like the two hour slot, Mm -hmm. um, and then since UConn's a master's program, some days we'll have class uh, before clinic or after clinic. Um, and then we also perform a lot of apicoectomies, so surgical procedures, in addition to the non-surgical root canal therapy, and also have a lot of experience with auto transplantation and intentional replantation, which is really cool. Could you elaborate a little bit on what, what those are? Because I actually have never heard of that before, so I'd appreciate yeah, that. Of course. Um, so the apicoectomy, that's usually a, when there is a failed root canal procedure, um, like, and you can't, for some reason, you can't do a retreatment, the lesion is too large, you, you need to go in surgically, or there's a post and a crown, you don't want to compromise drilling through the crown, that kind of thing. So with an apicoectomy, what you do is you basically lay a flap, um, you drill a what they call a bony crypt, you resect part of that root where there is that infection, and then you retro prep, and then fill that area. So you're basically getting to like the, that source of the infection from the other end. Um, okay. Auto transplantation is usually when there's a tooth that is non-restorable. So you need to extract that tooth, but you have a good donor tooth. So say you have a wisdom tooth that is good and has conical roots, it would be easier to extract. If you can extract that wisdom tooth atraumatically, then you can place it into the socket of the tooth you've just extracted. Oh, wow. That sounds really yeah. cool. <laughs> it is very cool. And we're really lucky because Dr. Safavi has done a lot of these auto transplantation cases um, and work we work with ortho sometimes um, on those cases um, and basically after that happens the tooth is splinted um, and usually two weeks later if the apex has already been closed on that donor tooth um, we would initiate root canal therapy and so 
it's almost like an implant, I guess, but with your own tooth, so it's even better. <laughs> That's really cool. So is this like a new form of uh, treatment? Like, I, I've never heard of this before. That's why I'm, I'm pretty interested by this. I think it's not new, but I'd say people probably don't do it very often in private practice just because there aren't too many studies on it. You know, there have been a lot of case reports, but not long follow-ups and I think it's a little more uncomfortable for people and usually a lot of times endodontists don't really want to do their own extractions anymore so maybe they could pair with an oral surgeon if they had one upstairs but it kind of takes a lot to prepare and you got to try to make sure you know the donor tooth is going to fit in that socket and even so sometimes they fail so I it's not really common in private practice but intentional replantation that's usually a little bit more common so that sometimes when say a tooth number 18 needs a retreatment or um but or it needs a surgery say it needs a surgery but the ia is right there and you don't want to drill in that area you're afraid you could cause paresthesia so intentional replantation is where you essentially extract that tooth then you kind of do an apical outside of the mouth so you cut off the root outside of the mouth the like retro prep fill it from that end and then you put it back in that socket okay. so that is done more often than auto transplantation in private practice um but you know both of them are to me, it's a little bit scary sometimes because when you extract the tooth, you have to be really careful. You don't want to disrupt any of the PDL cells or anything like that mm -hmm. to make sure that your body doesn't respond like as if it's a foreign object. So, so I'm curious about if there's a difference between types of residencies uh, for endodontics. Like, I, I'm I know that like orthodontics has like university and hospital based resident mm -hmm. is that the same for endodontics no i'd say most endo programs are about the same um depending on the program you're at though you may get hospital privileges and go into the or so at our program we do have a connection with the children's medical center so if they have like a pediatric case that needs to that needs endo then we'll scrub in and go into the OR and do the endo there. Some programs don't offer this, um, mm -hmm. but most, most programs are pretty similar. I say the biggest difference is, is that um, there are a few programs that are master's programs. So those are usually three-year programs. Mm -hmm. And then there are the other programs that are two-year programs um, without a master's. And then um, there are also paid programs versus non-paid programs. So, you know, usually, of course, the paid programs are going to be more competitive. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so how, how competitive was this specialty for you? So you weren't in dental school when you were applying, so maybe you didn't have, you, you didn't have to compete with your classmates, but in general, did you, did you worry about matching or finding a program? Yeah, so in my class, actually, no one applied straight out of dental school. Um, okay. So far, there are four that are either are now endodontists or were in residency, um, mm -hmm. but they were all at different years after we graduated. And Honestly, I was really surprised by how competitive endo is. Um, there are so many talented applicants out there. You know, there are so many people with years of experience. Some were already specialists in other fields and then decided now they want to do endo. Some were faculty like or like AGD program directors. Some applied multiple times. So it's definitely very competitive. And I'd say programs on average accept about three residents um, per year. I know as low as one, and then I believe there's a program that accepts maybe eight or 10, but usually it's around three. Um, and I'd say they interview about 20 residents out of 200 to 400 applicants. It seems like the number keeps on going up 
each year. And some years they say like the applicant pool has doubled. So it's definitely becoming more competitive. That's crazy. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, so what did you do to make yourself stand out, especially at UCSF where it's pass fail? So you can't really distinguish yourself with grades or GPA. So what, what did you do to, to, yeah. to stand out? So one of the things I did was to take the ADAT. So that's kind of an easy way to stand out from others. And then another thing is just having the general dentistry experience um, that helps. I think for me, working at a community clinic helped too, because you know, not as many dentists were working um, at community clinics as were working private practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then also taking an A, doing an AGD or a GPR mm -hmm. um, and becoming involved with research. So if you could just try to ask if you're by like the dental school or something like that, just trying to become involved in some kind of research project or becoming involved with the community, being a faculty member or volunteering, giving a CE course, that kind of thing. I didn't do those, but those are some things you can do to set yourself apart from others. So now that you're in your residency and like you're looking back at the stuff that you did, did you think any of your extracurriculars were maybe superfluous or like uh, you, you didn't need to do it or like dental schools weren't looking, I mean, not dental schools, the residency programs, they weren't looking for the stuff that you necessarily did um, mm -hmm. or no? I'd say no. I think anything that you can do to set yourself apart because it's just so competitive mm -hmm. um, is helpful. And Honestly, it seems like having, like in life, having connections um, will really help you as well. If you have connections with, or you have mentors that are currently in residency or were in residency, they can really help you um, prepare for the interview. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just having as much experience as possible will only help you. I see. So uh, I want to touch on that topic of uh, like networking and connections. Uh, so for you, did, did you have a mentor or someone, did you connect with different schools and reach out and just put yourself out there? Yeah, so at the time I was working in San Francisco, I uh, talked to my mentors back at UC San Francisco and so some of the endodontic faculty there and then I shadowed some of them um, at their offices. So that's something I would really recommend is um, shadowing an endodontist, especially because your letters should be from endodontists. At least they say at least two should be from an endodontist. Um, so I did that. I also got um, involved in some research and then I also talked to any of my friends I knew that had gone to endo programs and they really or sometimes it was a friend of a friend who would just give me their phone number to call them before an interview and that was really helpful um, just to know what to expect for an interview and since the interview is such a short time that you can have to set yourself apart from all the rest of the applicants. Um, that was really helpful as well. Those are great tips. So uh, my final question for you is, uh, you know, I'm a pre-dent. What if I was interested in endodontics or even if I wasn't, I didn't know anything about endodontics, what would you recommend to the to me and other pre-dents out there on what they can do to get started? if anything. So definitely shadow an endo office, uh, find a mentor, uh, make connections. You can also attend the American Association of Endodontists Convention, which is yearly. Uh, lately, it's been remote, but um, that's a really good convention. They have really good speakers there. So it's a good way to see, is this really for you? Um, and then I wouldn't really sweat it. Honestly, I think having a few years of general dentistry experience really helped me out. It helped me be able to, it just helped me be faster, you know, be able to remove caries faster. We, everything was just easier diagnosing. And I think 
it can only help you and it will help you later on as when you're a specialist to be able to connect better with your general dentist. Um, so I, I personally wouldn't really rush it. I feel like it'd be kind of hard to really know that you want to be an endodontist until you've done um, some root canals, uh, unless you already have family in it or something like that. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, that'll be it for this episode, everyone. Uh, Dr. Duong, if any of our viewers have any questions for you? Is it possible for them to reach out to you maybe through email or social media? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Yeah, by email would be best. Okay, cool. And I, we'll leave that in the description of this video. Uh, mm -hmm. And for the viewers out there, thank you for watching this video. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, if you have any questions for us at Future GDS, uh, you can DM us on Instagram at underscore future DDS, and we'll try to reply as soon as possible. Uh, until next time, see y'all then.